So we are starting the new sessions and we have taken up the Mandukya Upanishad, which will be the first of the Upanishads of this Light of Consciousness series. In this series we will be doing Mandukya Upanishad which is the shortest and the most profound of all Upanishads. We will also be doing the Isha Upanishad and the Mundak Upanishad. The Mandukya Upanishad is for just a quick brief summary is from the Atharveda which is the last of the Vedas and it's the shortest, the briefest and yet the most profound. It is said that if one does not read any of the Upanishads, any of the religious texts and would just read the Mandukya, you would acquire all the knowledge that you need to attain. The word Mandukya <clears throat> comes from Mandak, which means a frog. It has been quite a mystery and most people do not understand why the most profound of all Upanishads should be named after a frog. What is so special about a frog? There are many beautiful symbols such as the lotus. There are other symbols in yoga which we know of. Chakras, for example, are wheels, the wheels of life. Lotus is a symbol of one who stays above and yet lives in the world. And Yet, instead of choosing one of these very aesthetic and beautiful symbols, the, the frog was chosen. So it's quite a mystery. And most people do not understand why. And the reason they have not understood why this Upanishad is named after the frog is because these people are not practicing. Since the Indian philosophies have become easily available to the people of the West and in general to people throughout the world, they have been translated into English. This work was done primarily by scholars. Scholars, academicians, many of them of Western origin. Many of them were German like Max Müller or British like Woodruff or American. And these people learned Sanskrit and mostly did not even come to India, never met an Indian before. And yet they translated these things. Obviously, the result was a very, very intellectual and academic work. The next generation of writers who translated these works themselves were then Indians who had learned English and had some level of experience as well. And through these practitioners, the Upanishads took on a different meaning. One began to understand these not at an, as an intellectual philosophy, but as a practical philosophy. Yet the mystery has remained, what is the meaning of the frog? Why frog? The frog is a very interesting being, very interesting animal to study. Most of us have studied this animal, this creature, in biology. If you recall, some of your biology 
lessons from school. Maybe some of you also had to dissect a frog in your biology classes. The frog is a fascinating creature because it goes through a metamorphosis. Metamorphosis means a complete transformation. The young one of the frog looks nothing like the frog eventually will look like. When you, when you have a, a calf, the calf looks very similar to a cow. A, a, a child is very similar to an adult. You can recognize this is the young one of a human being. But the frog has little tadpoles. It lays eggs and then has tadpoles. And they look more like fish rather than frogs. And they evolve very rapidly into frogs. While the tadpoles are totally aquatic, aquatic and then live in water, they are unable to live outside, they become terrestrial or amphibians. They can live both in water as well as on land. You see this amazing metamorphosis that takes place is a complete transformation. Not only physical transformation, but that creature which was living in the water is now able to also live on land and can live both in water and land, an amphibian. The water is a symbol of the world. These worldly waters, one can say. It's exactly like the lotus, which is in the water, but above it, these waters are a symbol for the muddy waters or for the world with all its different gunas, which are there, which you have to take on during the course of your life, there are some scars which you pick up, which, you which get attached to you. It's considered to be like mud, you know, which makes you dirty if you go into the, those, those waters which are muddy, murky, dark, unclean, unclear. And when this... Little creature, these tadpoles evolve out of these muddy waters and suddenly become terrestrial beings. And they sit outside and they look at the water. They seem to be witnessing these muddy waters. And once in a while, every once in a while, when they want to, they jump into the water but they can come out again. They don't get stuck in those murky waters. They can come out again. And that filth, that dirt, that murky, slimy water, dirt does not stick to them either. And this evolution takes place very rapidly. It seems as though they evolving in a short span of a few months that which other creatures require millions of years to do. You know that all of us evolved out of water. Biologically, it has been shown, the studies have shown, the process of evolution came from the water from the oceans and even now they are studying some fish which are slowly learning to crawl on land. So that evolution which has taken us millions of years, it seems that the frog in sort of encompasses or encapsulate this evolutionary process in just 
a matter of a few months. The frog is therefore a beautiful symbol of an adhikari. An adhikari, the one who is a qualified student, one who is qualified to attain the highest. Such a seeker can become a witness, can attain that fourth which experiences the three states of consciousness which are all part of the world can be a witness and see these just as a frog who sits outside the pond and looks at the dark and murky waters occasionally jumping in and then coming out again he would be then even an arhant or arihant, one who comes to teach and to help those who are still in the world to evolve. And that is why this Upanishad is called Manduk Ya Upanishad, the frog Upanishad. It is the symbol of the witness of the one who is a qualified student and a adhikari, one who goes through a rapid evolution and process a process like a complete transformation or a metamorphosis. And this is why this Upanishad is called Mandukya or the Frog Upanishad. This Upanishad teaches universal truths. It is not based on religion or beliefs or philosophies. It is about consciousness. It's about pure consciousness. In religion, we talk about rituals, we talk about deities, idol worship, there are customs, there are certain beliefs, there are superstitions. That's that whole drama, which we call religion. That is something else. Mandukya has little to do with that kind of religion. The Mandukya talks about universal truths. It is also not a philosophy. Philosophy as we understand in the Western sense is more an intellectual study of life and this is not meant to be an intellectual study. It is deeply connected with meditation and the direct experience of the fourth, which is known as Turiya. I can say that of all the scriptures, whether we talk about the Bhagavad Gita or any of the Upanishads or the Tantras, the Yoga Sutras, any of the scriptures, this one scripture or text stands out in its universality, in the beauty and the simplicity of this scripture, which comprises only of 12 verses. This is a short scripture, a very profound scripture, and I am presuming that we will not require more than 10 to 12 sessions to cover it. It all depends on your uh, engagement, how much you participate and... Uh, how 
deep your interest is. <clears throat> Any questions so far before we dive into the first verse? Good. In that case, we begin with the first verse. Hariyom, the entire universe is the syllable Om. The following is the exposition of Om. Everything in the past, present and future is verily Om. That which is beyond time, space and causation is also Om. The very first verse summarizes the entire scripture. Following this ancient Indian tradition of putting in the very first verse or the very first chapter the entire overview of what is to follow, this verse also does the same. It is the entire scripture in a nutshell. And what is it saying? It is saying everything is Om. Here, Om is spelled O-M. However, it should be spelled A-U-M. This spelling of Om comes down from the times of the academic um, scholars, translators who translated it at that time without having a complete understanding of the scripture as well as the Devanagari, the, the script. Eventually that was corrected to what would be a more accurate spelling, which is A-U-M. And we will, of course, go through that uh, scripture to understand why A-U-M, O-M, is um, a more accurate way of spelling this sound. This verse says, everything is Om. It says, it goes, it encompasses all time, past, present, as well as future. It encompasses space as well. Everything around us is Om. And it encompasses causation as well. We will try to understand these three aspects. Om covers time, space and causation. Encompasses all three. Before we go into the details of this, you must know that Om is primarily a sound. It's not just a mantra or a syllable, it's a sound. Om is Anahat Nada. Anahat is the unstruck sound. Nada is sound. When I clap, this is struck sound. Any sound is made by striking two objects. So when I clap, it's by striking my hands together. When you hear a musical instrument, if you play the sitar or guitar, you're creating that sound by striking the string. 
If you play the piano or a key instrument, you're creating the sound by striking. If you look in the piano, there are little, small little tiny little hammers which are striking against, a, against the strings. This creates a vibration and that creates a sound. So all this sound that you hear is struck sound. It is created by striking two things together. Bata anhat nada om is an unstruck sound. It is heard in deep meditation. While OM is a sound, it is also a symbol. And that syllable OM, spelled A-U-M, is a symbol that needs to be interpreted and understood. This scripture interprets, explains the symbol OM. When you understand the symbol OM, you integrate that understanding in you through meditation. That can lead you to the original sound OM, the unstruck sound, which you could hear in deep meditation. There is a Zen Quan that some of you may have heard of. It says, it's a question, it asks, what is the sound of one hand clapping? The sound of one hand clapping is OM. Because you cannot clap with one hand. You need two hands to clap. So that sound which is unstruck is Om. Om is everything. Time, space is well as causation. Om is another word for pure consciousness, which pervades and permeates every aspect of our life and this universe. So what is consciousness? In very simple words that we can relate to, consciousness is awareness. It's attention. It's your being. Right now, as you are listening to my voice, you try to step back. Just observe yourself. Observe yourself listening to me speaking. Who is listening? And you become aware of, of, of something. It's diffuse perhaps. But you have just expanded your awareness. That awareness is... Consciousness, being conscious, being aware. This awareness or consciousness is life itself. This awareness leads us to that deeper being in, within you, which has the quality of life itself. So OM is all of this. It's pure consciousness. It's life itself. It's the universe. It's everything around you. Sri Ram asks, what is the intent of this verse? It seems like 
This verse is difficult to comprehend without direct experience. Is this meant as a summary of what to expect and to inspire? We must remember that the Mandukya Upanishad, which is part of the Atharveda, the last of the Vedas, is part of lineages and traditions. They, they were custodians of the, this um, Upanishad and they were kept from the layperson. They were not meant for everybody. These were part of the secret teachings or which were given only to those who would understand it through direct experience. And these lineages that were custodians of these scriptures, they had this wisdom, this knowledge, and those who encountered the scripture, who were initiated into the scriptures, were having a certain background already. In our modern lives, of course, most of us are studying this perhaps a little bit intellectually. We may be doing a little practice, but we may not always have the insights or the experiences. It requires a certain guidance and deeper meditation to understand it in its entirety. The first verse sounds uh, esoteric. And as you said, Sri Ram, it's difficult to comprehend this. But it simply means that Om is universal consciousness. It's another word for universal consciousness, also known as Brahman. And while we may speak of things like individual consciousness and universal consciousness, most of us do not have the experience of these things. We, most of us are on the path and working towards that, aspiring to that. It may inspire some or it may even frighten some. If you listen carefully and let these things just sink into your consciousness accompanied with meditation in a systematic approach to meditation then this scripture has a consciousness transforming or consciousness raising power it can really do that it can make you into a different person when you are able to grasp <clears throat> its true meaning accompanied together with practice. Don't let it frighten you or let it put you off. The first couple of verses may seem a little bit difficult, but it gets easier. So I will go to the second verse, which already is a little bit easier. Manisha asks, if Om is unstruck sound, then why, how, where did the practice of Omkar or saying or singing Om arise? Yes, now that arose because people were not paying attention to the verse 1. <laughs> I mean, I'm making a little joke here. It's actually kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's kind of sad. But those people who were not able to understand because they were not practicing, they were not getting the guidance 
or they were simply not ready for it, they didn't know what to else to do. They said, okay, then that's how things happen in religion, you know. That's why I said this is not a religion. That's exactly what happens in religion. Things become superstition. They're, things are twisted and turned into this is bad, this is good, you know. And people who don't understand, they twist things. Saying Om Ka, saying the word Om, singing, chanting is a harmless thing. So no major harm done. But there have been beautiful aspects that have been twisted and turned. And, you know, all these superstitions where people have been put into castes and, and so many people have suffered because of this kind of being, you know, um, treated as a inferior person or women have been treated through centuries um, unfairly because of certain ideas you know so chanting Om has been relatively harmless or has been totally harmless it does no harm but it actually does not help you much either when I say it does not help much, a lot of people get angry about that. I had a person here a couple of years ago, here in Germany. He was a German person, a yoga teacher. And he was taking, he was giving classes where he would get his students to chant Om at the end of his asana classes. And when he came here to me and we were talking about Mantra Vidya and I mentioned this, he got very angry because he was convinced that what he was doing was right. I was not meaning to hurt him in any way and I don't think there is any harm in singing or chanting Om, but it's not necessarily useful. Mantra Vidya is a science and how one chants and what one chants and how these mantras are practiced is a science on its own. And that should be learned and practiced with guidance from an experienced teacher. From a lineage such as us, which is based on this. It's based on Mantra Vidya. So, those who didn't understand verse 1, clearly, they started chanting, Oh. But now we go to verse 2, and maybe we will get some insights and understand this. And... That would also clarify some of the questions that Sri Ram had. Verse 2 says, All this whatsoever is seen here, there and everywhere is Brahman. This very self, Atman, is Brahman, the absolute reality. This Atman has four aspects. Everything is Brahman. Brahman means the universal consciousness. The word Brahman, just for some of you who are not clear or not sure, some people mix up the word Brahman with Brahmin, with Brahmanas or with Brahma. These are four different things. So Brahman is a pandit or a priest or a ritualist. He's a custodian of the scriptures. No, he's generally, you can just say he's a, a priest. The Brahmanas are Vedic texts, just like the Upanishads are texts. Brahmanas are also texts from the Vedas. Brahma is one of the gods. It's a god of creation. There's Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. 
These are the Trinity. Brahma is one of the gods. But Brahman is universal consciousness. And all the gods are a part of that. The deities and everything, they're just one of the layers in that Brahman. Brahman is everything. Brahman is Om. Brahman is universal self, is cosmic self. Now, Brahman is the same as Atman. For those of you who are, who are aware of these things, Atman is individual consciousness and Brahman is universal consciousness. What is the difference between the two? Nothing. There's no difference. One is universal, it's everywhere, and the other is inside of you. But the nature of the two, the quality of the two, is the same. I take a drop of water and I put it into a lake or an ocean. What happens to it? It becomes the ocean. Because the nature of the drop and that of the ocean is the same. So the drop becomes the ocean. So it is with the individual self. You just carry it with you. The ocean is all around you. So universal consciousness is everything. You yourself are a part of universal consciousness. Now this individual consciousness that is in you has four aspects. You should understand that these are four aspects. Um, it's not a division. It's a, it remains undivided. But we just see it from different angles. The first one is the waking state. And that is given the symbol A or A. The second aspect is the dreaming state. That is U. The third aspect is deep sleep. And the fourth is the one who witnesses these three. While the first three are part of the gunas, the fourth is the experiencer itself, the witness. This fourth is not really a state of consciousness. It's the one witnessing. And that's why it is merely called the fourth. There is no other word for it. The fourth is Turiya. It means literally the fourth. Sri Ram asks, is realizing Atman same as realizing Brahman? Or is there further work required to move from Atman to Brahman? Absolutely right. Realizing Atman is realizing Brahman. When you know the drop, you know the ocean. Because there's no difference between the drop and the ocean. When the drop goes into the ocean, it becomes the ocean. When you realize individual consciousness, there's a sense of expansion into universal consciousness. When you realize that you are pure consciousness, you realize everybody and everything is pure consciousness. So these are the three states. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. And they have 
been symbolically given alphabets A for waking, U for dreaming and Ma for deep sleep which makes it Aum, Om. If you see it from the point of view of the Devanagari script it is A, U and Ma. These are from the, the vowels. The first one is A and the middle is U and at the end is um, and that makes it om. So now you know the meaning behind om. It means these three states and it is a symbol. You know, it's like a um, abbreviation. Well, there are many abbreviations like, um, yeah, all the different abbreviations in the world. The first thing which came into my head was actually USA, which is the United States of America. You know, the word, the letter U, stand, U stands for United, S for States, A for America. And when you know that, you it suddenly comes with a big sort of picture. Perhaps some of you saw the map of the United States. Some of you may have thought of a person you know from there. Some of you may have thought of some stereotypes which come from the United States. You know, Statue of Liberty or burgers or cola or coke or something like that. And Om is a symbol which encompasses many such ideas. Just as the abbreviation USA actually tells us all these different things, you know, these images, these ideas, it, it carries so much with it. You don't really even realize it until you think about it a little bit. Similarly, OM carries all this knowledge with it. Once you know it, you don't forget it. It's a kind of a mnemonic. It's a way to remember something. Maybe in school you used a mnemonic. When you wanted to remember something, you created a little abbreviation so that you remembered something that you had to learn. And so, in a sense, it's a mnemonic. The ancient sages created these symbols as teaching tools. Remember, they didn't have really books at that time. This was the oral tradition. This wisdom and knowledge was handed down in a lineage from teacher to student. And they had to acquire ways of memorizing, learning, understanding and grasping. So these were teaching tools. And in a sense, these tools are much more superior to many of the teaching tools that we have today. Because when you have books, when you have videos, when you have uh, all sorts of uh, aids, to help you learn, in a sense, you become dependent on these teaching aids. And when you don't have too many of these aids, you have to integrate that knowledge. And you have to integrate the juice of the knowledge. Even if you don't remember all the details, you have to get the juice of it. And so here, they put the juice of this in three letters put together. Om. Om is a symbol of waking, dreaming and sleep state. Good. Any questions so far? Manisha, was the Devanagari script already available at that time? Hmm. Good question. 
I really do not know. I really do not know about the development of the Devanagari in the script. The um, and Om, how it then developed into that. Um, and I am guessing that nobody really will be able to answer that question. Because Om, the word itself, is there already in the Rig Veda, which is the oldest of the Vedas, which probably predates writing, maybe, I don't know, or in some other form. And it's possible that the language was there. Yeah. Sorry, somebody said something? Yes, it could be just sounds. The sound Om definitely existed because, as I said, that is Anahat Nada. And so, those sages who were meditating, they heard the sound and the sound was definitely known. Whether it was in this form, as a script, already in the Rig, time of the Rig Veda, I do not know. But by the time of the Atharveda, it was. That is the time where also the, the books or the works of the of Ayurveda are from the Atharveda. So, so definitely by then it was. Manisha, if you're interested, actually there's a great deal of new information coming about uh, about the history of those people, you know, the Vedic times, that actually shatters all that we know about history as we know it now. Um, but maybe we should keep that for another time. It seems that, that these civilizations were far more advanced and far more older than we thought. Indian tradition has said that this knowledge comes to us for, from around 6,000 years ago. Western historians have said, oh, the Vedic, Rig Veda is around 1,500 BC, which makes it around 3,000 years old, a little bit over. But Indian tradition says over 6,000 years. Now, if they had such an advanced way of thinking, then it's very likely that the civilization already emerged much earlier to have reached to this sophisticated level. And current excavations in marine uh, archaeologists have found off the coast, of the western coast, of the coast of Gujarat, many um, signs of civilization which is now underwater, which indicates that they have probably been um, very advanced civilizations existing already um, almost, you know, 30,000, uh, sorry, uh, 10,000 years ago. So I think that right now nobody can answer that question. We're going to let uh, other people work on that. Good, so... <clears throat> uh, Krishna had a question. Okay, that was Krishna. I was wondering who that was. Okay, Krishna, what was that? <laughs> oh, I miss Krishna's question. And somehow, Krishna, when you speak, somehow I don't hear anything. There seems to be something with the sound. But the question is, why is the ultimate knowledge, especially through sound and hearing? We as humans have five sensory channels and hearing is chosen as a special channel to receive the ultimate knowledge. Hmm. Krishna, to be very honest, I, I do not know whether 
urine is a special channel, but it comes from Nada Bindu. There's Nada and there's Bindu, which means that the ultimate reality, when we move towards the ultimate reality, you hear Anahat Nada, you hear it. Or you see the light of consciousness, you see it. And which is why you experience it in the form of seeing or hearing, listening actually. This state of that, that highest reality is not smelled, it's not, um, t it's not touched or, you know, it's not experienced as touch and um, it's not really tasted. It is experienced as seeing the light of consciousness or hearing the sound, anhat nada. So you can experience that in either of these two ways and which is why the emphasis on sound or light. So it's not as if the um, sound and hearing is chosen as a special channel. It's a universal truth. It's a universal reality which is experienced in deep meditation. Mita says, what are the importance of these three states? Does one have to go through these three states to realize Atman? Well, you are going through the three states all the time. You are in your waking consciousness right now. When you rest at night, you go to your dreaming consciousness and deep sleep. So it's not something you have to go through. These are not stages. This is a description of reality. Do you understand? This scripture is not telling you what to do. These are not instructions. I explained that in the Bhagavad Gita as well. There are parts like chapter 2. There are parts where <clears throat> it says, I have said repeatedly, these are not instructions. This is a description of the reality. Don't turn it into an instruction. Coming back to that question with Manisha put, why are people chanting Om? Because they begin to think this is an instruction. So then Mita says, oh, do we have to go through these states? You're beginning to think this is an instruction. They have to go stage by stage from waking to dreaming to deep sleep. No, this is a description of reality. What we're going to do with that description of reality, that's a different question that you have to discuss with your teacher. That is why this tradition is very clear that earlier these scriptures were kept secret and they were only given and handed down to those who were ready. In the beginning of this meeting, I said, this was for the Kharis. These were for the qualified students who had a tremendous speedy development that which you see in a frog that evolutionary process is so fast it's for the best students it's for the highly qualified adhikaris and so a word of caution these are not instructions this is a description of this reality and what you do you have to do together with your teacher who will guide you. 
Okay, I'm going to go back to the verse and I'm going to take this opportunity before I um, go to verse 3 to remind you that the chat should be for short questions, not long paragraphs, and use the chat only if you cannot use, uh, if you cannot speak, if you have background noise, okay? I would like to limit the parallel conversation and um, the use of the chat uh, in a, should be done in a very disciplined manner. So please be mindful of that. Thank you. Verse 3. Uh, though it's almost time to end. So I think um, I will not go to verse 3. Because that would be a pity. Um, it's a very, very interesting verse about the waking stage of consciousness, which is um, what we all are experienced about. We understand, but we should go into that um, in the next session. So I will take questions. And Sri Ram asked if all religions point to the same ultimate reality. Assuming all religions are founded on the direct experience of the founder, then the base of all should be Om. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, not really, Sri Ram. Think carefully. What do the Muslims say? They say, Amin. What do the Christians say? They say, Amen. What, do, what does one say in India? Om, which is spelled how? A-U-M. Om, Aum. Does not that sound similar to Amen and Amin? It is the same. What has happened, however, is that the people who do not practice and have not attained do not understand what they're saying. So if you ask the Ask these people, why are you saying Amen? Why are you saying Om at the beginning of your prayer? Why are you saying Amen at the end of your prayer? They do not know. They do not know it. Which I explained already. That's because people are not practicing. People are not going into deep meditation. Deep meditation is meant for the privileged few who have a longing for that, who have overcome all obstacles to find guidance and are willing to give up many things so that they can pursue that intense longing. That is an adhikari, and that is why everybody else starts using the word Om or Amen or Amin as a kind of a word which one begins or ends the prayer with. Perhaps some of you did not know this until today when we started reading this. And understanding this and you can ask some of your friends who are Christians do you know what Amen means ask your friends who are Muslims do you know what Amin means ask others who are coming from a Hindu background do you know what Om means they don't know nobody knows it has become a part of religion, which is why I said right in the beginning, it is not religion. This is not about religion. This is about pure consciousness. This is not about gods and goddesses. This is not about rituals. This is, we don't need to start wars about this. This is a common universal experience if you are open to having that experience, 
it will completely transform your consciousness. You will become a different person. You will no longer be a person. Like the tadpole which became a frog, which is nothing like a tadpole, you will have a metamorphosis. And it's a quantum leap. You know, it's not gradually moving from one step to another kind of evolution, but a quantum leap. And when you are ready for that leap into the unknown, then you will really understand the meaning of the Upanishad because you will have gone through that experience. Right now, it may remain a little bit intellectual. Those of you who are practicing and those who are working with me, we, we keep going through these things and we will continue to go through these things so that you have a greater understanding of, of this. Okay. Any more questions before we end our session? So this session we did an introduction. We covered the introduction to the Mandukya Upanishads and we have covered verses 1 and 2. We will continue this next Friday, same time. And we sort of dive into the heart of the Upanishad now, where we will go through each of these levels of consciousness. So we will go into waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and the one beyond the witness. It's going to be very interesting. It will challenge many of your current ideas, perceptions. It will also, um, if you listen carefully and understand, then it will be also really transforming your consciousness. All right, so have a nice weekend, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, bye, Daddy. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, bye, Mita. Bye, Chandrasekhar. Bye. Bye, Survi. Bye.